Hello and welcome to Bastionland Broadcasting, where tonight we are looking at uh, the book that when I looked through it uh, before I came on the stream a little bit earlier today, it, I, I can you can put this as a quote, it genuinely terrified me, but not because of the terrifying monsters inside, but for a reason that I'll get to uh, when we get to it. But there was something in here that um, that made me immediately start to panic. And then, luckily, I was I was relieved to realise it was not not what I thought. So there you go. How's that? How's that for a teaser? That's a good introduction, isn't it? So um, so we're here, Bastion and Broadcasting. Uh, I does it does it count as complaining about the weather if I say that I'm not going to complain about the heat? But what I will say is, we have um, we are we are experiencing uh, intense global warming in this room specifically. So. I've got all the windows open, which when I started doing these streams, I was like, I'm going to be super professional. I'm going to have a pop shield on here. I'm going to, um, I'm going to wear headphones. I'm going to have all the windows closed. So it's like, um, an anechoic chamber. Um, but now fuck it. It's been long enough. I'm open. I'm leaving the windows open. So don't be alarmed when you hear police cars and ice cream vans going past. That's just, that's just my street. Um, so we are looking at a folklore, Bestiary. I always love a monster book, especially a bestiary. I've been reading. I, I, I've. I think I blogged about this a little bit when I was writing about some of the monsters for um, Primeval Bastionland. But I, I'm on a real kick at the moment for the the more kind of mythic folklore approach to monsters. I, I've, I've never been a huge fan of the. There's a certain school of like D and D monster design where they're like World of Warcraft monsters, where they're they're like combat encounters. Like that's never really appealed to me. It's just not it's not really for me. Um, I have always liked kind of like more horror, sci-fi, weird monster things. But um, lately, I'm really getting into the kind of the story behind the monsters and perhaps what the monster kind of represents, if it has any kind of significance for this culture. But enough waffling. We're gonna have a look. Um, so I should say this is available uh, on Kickstarter. I, I, you know what? Today I practiced. I was like, which way do I need to point? And I was like, I've got I've got a system down. So uh, I'm pointing. No, I'm pointing this way <laughs> for this for this uh, screen. And on this one, I'm pointing this way. Okay, I've I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. It's it's th there's varying degrees of professionalism tonight. Um, the windows open. The sound low professionalism. But pointing is going to be um, high professionalism. So look, look, I can I can point that. Um, so <laughs> this is made by uh, the Merry Mushmen, who you may know from the Knock zines, amongst other things. Um, so for full disclosure, I have worked with them before in the sense that they have used some of my blog posts and things for uh, for issues of Knock. I am not involved in this one specifically. Um, but th there's the full disclosure that I, I do have an existing relationship with them in that sense. Um, but uh, this is not a review and it is not an advert. It's just a thing. I, I was offered to get a little preview of it, so I thought I'd give it a look through. Might hate it. You never know. It might be it might be terrible. Eric's going to regret uh, letting me letting me see it early. But this is on Kickstarter now. Um, if you just search for a folklore bestiary, it, it's on there now. And there's I think there's about two weeks left on it. I think. Um, okay, so. This is a preview copy, so bear in mind, it may not be may not be um, completed yet. So, we have some characters. I would like to know the... I, I like that we open with these characters. I'm assuming there's a story behind them. If they're just the characters from the cover, that's cool, and I like that a lot. And here we go. You can see all the people who are involved. And I should say, there are two versions of this. There's a... Uh, an OSC version, Old School Essentials, and a 5th edition D&D version. Um, and uh, you can choose which one you get uh, on the Kickstarter. And we're just going to go through. It's it's not, it's, 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 it's 42 pages. So what I like about this is it's not like, like the, 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 the teenager in me loves big monster manuals with like, this, this monster manual has, 250 monsters in it but how many of those monsters are good um so this this goes into more detail on a smaller number of monsters than you might get in some other books um 
And I'm now going to reveal the thing that terrified me. So this, um, I'm, I'm really grateful to have pronunciations. This is the Bacha Yuan, uh, which is a Basque um, sort of creature. And they lived here long before we came. From them, we stole the secrets of breeding and farming. These rustic giants roaming the mountains and forests living in secret beautiful caves are sometimes called the wild lords because they know the secrets of nature here are some true stories about them and then you've got a number of stories here labeled one two three four five six and when i saw this i'm not trying to make this all about me but i thought shit this is that structure is very similar to what i've just come up with for um primeval bastion land and i thought oh i've created a really um Something I'm really happy with here for this this structure for the way that uh, the way that omens are described, and this is kind of similar. And I thought, is this book going to be just the thing I'm trying to make? And they've already made it, and it's fantastic. Um, but this is just this is just the way that this first monster is is um, is framed. So I, I I breathed a sigh a, a sigh of relief after that. Um, so I'm not going to sit and read through each of these, but we have this big weird shepherd giant guy. And we have some truths about them. Uh, six, presumably, so we can roll a d6. We have very straightforward OSE style stat blocks. And then we have some abilities that it can do. And then it goes even further. So you have like extra bits of lore about the, the Bassendary, who are the females. Uh, Eric, very kind words. But I mean, the, the fact is, we're we're all just stealing things from each other. So I've I've made my peace with that now. Um, they have names that only their relatives know. Shout the name in his domain, and he's compelled to come and see who's calling to him. Greet him by name, and you get a bonus of two to your reaction roll. This is the kind of stuff I like. It's at the bottom of my uh, draft document at the moment. I have um, I have I've, I've wrote a bit last week about um, these kind of almost mantras like short phrases to remember and for this project when i'm writing um when i'm writing like these myth mythic elements um i have like remember fairy tale logic is like one of the things i have written there um and fairy tale logic is just things like this like rules of the world so it could result in a mechanical bonus but it could also be something like if you greet him by name if you ask him a question by name, he has to answer the question. It, it could just be something that is like a, a diegetic part of the world. But it, it's also nice to have that mechanical element as well. We have sample names, always, always handy. We have what you can do with their hair. You can make... I'm not sure if you can um, read that clearly there. So you can make like fancy rope. Bowstrings that double the range of the weapon. And they have riddles. So this is like, it's one monster, but it's one monster that's like a cool social encounter because you've got this trick with a name. They've got a load of like combat abilities here. So if you are going to fight them or be involved in a fight alongside them, they, um, they've they got some interesting things they can do. They've got something you can make from their, uh, from their hair. And hair is a good one because you don't have to kill this thing to get its hair. Um, and in fact, you, you, you're better off not doing that because if it catches you with some hair that you've stolen, it's it's not going to be happy. Um, they're like riddles. And if you ask them a riddle, he has to make a save or just stop what he's doing and try the riddle. But, but they're not very good at it. And there we go. And then we have these kind of half. So these are half giant versions of the things we just had. As a class. And then there will there will be a, I'm going to guess there is going to be a map here. And that's it. We've got like six pages of just luxuriating in this one monster. And it's not just like some, it's not just an orc or a dragon. Like, you know, it, I'm, I'm always up for reading six pages about an orc or a dragon. Like, I won't lie. But it's something that's fresh to me, 
if you're in the Basque country, this might be like the most boring thing you've ever seen. But um, it certainly feels fresh, fresh to me. So I, I do like that they're doing that. And you've got your hooks down here. So the thing that I... Um, I, I tweeted this earlier this week and it was kind of it was kind of a shit post but then it was um that there was like a meaning behind it which was that I said that I was thinking about like encounter design and usually when I try and come up with these like short snappy things it's not because I'm trying to create some kind of like it's 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 a very selfish motive I'm trying to create it for me because I need to just remember short things a lot of the time when I'm trying to work out how to run an encounter or how to design an encounter and the thing that the three words that i came up with were um sticky sticky chewy and juicy and some of the, the sticky element was inspired by uh, a blog post by patrick stewart but sticky means that you can't ignore it and it's gonna you, you can't kind of just walk past it chewy means that if you are going to get involved there's no easy way through it it's not like you just go and press the button it's it's chewy. It's going to require some work to get something out of it. Um, and juicy is the even if you ignore it or you do engage with it, it's going to leave a mess and an impact on the world. So chewy, no sticky, chewy, juicy are the three um, encounter words that we're remembering. And we're going to be look think we're going to be thinking about them as we go through some of these. I'm going to move on because I, otherwise I'll be stuck on this giant all all evening. You know what I I am not. I mean, my understanding is the the idea behind this, um, the pointing, it's gone again. The idea behind this vestry is that it's um, perhaps creatures that have not received sort of RPG representation in the past. Um, and these guys immediately, maybe it's just that I've drunk too much Belgian beer over the years, but I'm getting like... Is it Le Chouf that has the little gnome guy on the bottle? Um, so I'm, I'm immediately drawn to, <laughs> drawn to these little gnomes. I'm getting, I'm getting a feeling. Um, so these are the, the uh, Kabouter. Shy diminutive gnomes who dwell in the low countries. They love to drink and will help someone in need in exchange for some good Abbey beer or interesting liquor. Yeah, so they're like little beer gnomes. I like it, and and people, I remember there was always this when I would used to, when I used to like read through monster manuals and like D and D stuff. I would think, why why are they wasting this page on like, um, like a blink dog or a, I I, I never read and I never experienced the flump before. It was like an ironic thing, but like the flump um like what were they called like the angel type like all the good creatures because i was like why are you putting all these good creatures in here because you want to put evil creatures in your dungeon but i like i mean these might have a sinister rage we haven't finished reading them yet but i like having weird magical beings that still have their own agenda it's the fairy tale logic like you can give them their weird like fey agenda but um but they don't have to be like evil like, i do like this type of creature okay so they have plant magic and they can drink very well we have some hooks we have five families of this type of creature i always like like a subtype i think it's um it, it, it's always nice to have like different skins makes it sound very like video gamey but like 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 different subtypes of a of a creature so that if you wanted to make a if, 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 so it felt like if you wanted to make a, a session or even like a mini campaign that was like really focused on these little guys you could do it uh, where to find them belongings nice i like them okay this guy is horrible um he is from Serbia. And it's a, a Bukovats. A mysterious amphibious beast. So it's like a weird like heron frog spider. Okay, what's this guy's deal? 
yeah, so this is phrased as like, it's like an SCP um, wiki article. <laughs> it's phrased as like reports, I guess, um, which I appreciate. So what's their deal? They've got a weakness, always good. They hunt at night. They grab you and pull you underwater, which is always like something I I, I don't I don't want to say it's underused, but I feel like it's it's so horrific. It's it's such a powerful, <laughs> horrible image being dragged underwater by a by a creature. I, I feel like I, I I would like to see it more. Okay, and the locals are like weirdly obedient to this creature. Nice. Now I did look at this one. Uh, Lou Karkul. Lou Karkul. A gargantuan snail from southern France. I mean, look at that. I, I don't even. Th this is the perfect time for me to take a drink because just, just soak that in. So, giant snail with tentacles, hates daylight, it's got stinging bristles, it's got acid breath, and we've got a load of hooks. That is a, that is a quality snail. And then, not only is it a snail, it is a dungeon. And that's what I like. Like they could, like if if you were asking me, and I I would not want to be project managing a project with so many authors. It sounds I'm getting like tense at just the thought of it. But if you said to me like, okay, we're going to make this book, we're going to have all these creatures, because I like kind of like a structure for better or worse. Sometimes a structure is useful. Sometimes it gets in the way. I would be like, okay, so we're going to have full page of art, maybe or maybe like not quite full page and like some text at the bottom, and then we'll have all the text on here, and each spread will be one creature. And then we'll have like, I don't know, 100 creatures, whatever. But what they've done is by by really just going into it, you get these weird like, like they have the luxury of being able to do this and have like a weird like, this monster is a dungeon. Although I feel like I'm not a snail. Uh, what, what would be a somebody that studies an expert in snails? A, a snailologist. I'm not a snailologist, but um, is, is this where the exit is? on a snail's anatomy because that seems like an unfortunate unfortunate kind of place um, I can see Rich in the chat is asking about is there a UK monster um, I think there is I did I did look through and I, th I think I saw at least one uh, so we're back in Basque country this is Tartaro I feel like I know this name one-eyed ogre shepherds roaming the wild hills and mountains of the Pyrenees they love a they love a shepherd giant in the Basque country, don't they? That's what I'm uh, learning today. <laughs> so what's the deal with a big eye? So they're ah they have they have some powers. Mellifuous voice, light beam. Ah, so they're not all the same. I see. So, so at the risk of like um, condensing this presumably like ancient Basque myth into just like a D and D thing, well, it's like it's like a beholder ogre, isn't it? It's like an ogre with like a beholder eye. No, that's terrible of me to say, but it it, it is a it, it is funny how these themes kind of keep recurring. Uh, es Escargologist, I, I don't know if es I don't I can't imagine. Yeah, malacologist is probably right, but escargologist is better. So I'm going to stick with escargologist as a snail expert. That would have been a failed career in Electric Bastion and if I'd thought about it at the time. There's there's, there's definite snail underrepresentation in Electric Bastion. And now I think about it, you think there must be snails in there. So somebody that has the PDF can do a find, find snail and tell me how many entries for snail there are in Electric Bastion. And. Okay, we're not, we're not talking about my book. We're talking about this book. So we have our hooks. Um, 
He has some treasures. Nice. Okay, we're gonna. I'm gonna, I'm gonna speed it up slightly because I want to just give like an. You get. You get the idea now, and I don't want to necessarily like talk through every single one. But we're gonna look through some highlights, and then in about ten minutes' time, I want to talk about something else related to this a little bit. Um. This is a bad patchy. Um, he's just like <laughs> just a badass blacksmith who the devil devil is afraid of. Is this what am I thinking of? Some story about a blacksmith hitting the devil? I thought that was I mean, I know that myths are kind of tangled up. I thought I'd heard that as like an old like English thing, something someone about somebody a blacksmith grabbing the devil and hitting him with a hammer. Um apparently there are seven mentions of the word snail and electric bastion. That that's not bad. I don't feel too bad now. Yeah, so he's just a... Oh, I see. Yeah, he's just a blacksmith that, I guess, can fight off devils, which is good. Ooh. So we're in the Channel Islands now. Uh, Araguse. Weird little, weird little guys does do something for me. Like, like I always love the borrowers, the carpet people. Even if they were just mundane small people that had like a weird ocean thing going on, I'd, I'd be on board with it. They, <laughs> okay, so they're, they're three foot tall. I, I want them to be smaller. I, I would make them too. Um, they're tiny little white gnomes. Um, seaweed and webbed feet and hands. That, and they come and raid, raid a human settlement and drive out all the men, and take their place. This is this is getting more horrifying. They spit in your eye. They can curse. Oh, a random curse table. I'm in now. Uh, and they can cast dimension door. So I I'm gonna I'm not gonna look, but we're gonna say random curse number fourteen. You need <laughs> you need to pee every turn. That's a good curse. Well, no, it's not a good curse. It's a bad curse, but it's a it's a strong curse to have in your game. Uh, we are in Ukraine. This is the uh, Perelesnik. Slavic folklore warns about the Perelesnik or fiery serpent. It feeds on regrets and broken dreams. Wow. Okay. That is a good... That is a good snake. The art is fantastic. Like, I'll talk a little bit about the art when we get to the next thing. But um, it's it's such a cliche to say a picture's worth a thousand words. But like this this gets this is what makes me want to run this monster already before I even know what weird abilities it has. Uh, the Hellwagen from Germany. For, for a second, I thought it was just a car. Uh, which did amuse me. It's, it's a hell hell wagon. Um, La Velu from Pays de Loire in France. So what's this guy? Oh God! Yeah, Noah refused to take one of these on board, but it survived anyway. This is its layer. Children of, ah, sorry, the green children of Woolpit. Here we go. We're in Suffolk now, Suffolk, England. Uh, from a world far away came the green children. Who knows when more will follow them? So yeah, creepy children, always bad. What's their deal? They've got extraterrestrial biology. They come what? They come from a place they call Saint Martin's Land. What's this from? Who's where's the folklore expert going to tell me where this is from? Well, I've I've not heard this specific thing before, but I should clarify I'm not from Suffolk and I've never lived in Suffolk. Um, yeah, that's cool though. I like that. Uh, the P.O. Chant. Hope you enjoy my French pronunciation. It's flawless, I'm sure. Uh, these are from Lorraine. 
again, just like, I'm just. I, I think part of it is because I, I'm still. When I read Neverland, uh, the sort of hex crawl based on Neverland uh, last year, I think it was. Um, that book really kind of got me excited. I've never been excited about like the idea of having fairies in the game, but that book really sort of condensed down the weird fairy tale logic behind fairies, and really made me think they're a great little tool to have. And th these guys are horrible. Like little rat rat fairies, I guess. Oh, they're peaceful. Sorry, I'm I'm judging I'm judging them. They only meddle with the affairs of mortals whose crops take over the woods. Yeah, I mean, fair play. The um, this is this is the one where they choose to not give me pronunciation. Uh, my my Port my Brazilian Portuguese pronunciation is not. Not as high caliber as my French. Um, I'm going to say uh, Boatata. Giant serpent. I mean, I'd, big snakes are always good, aren't they? I would kind of be... I feel like you could just do a book of big snakes. When, when this when this book explodes... Here you go, Eric. This is, this is what we'll do. When this book explodes, do like, I don't know, 10, 12 more of them. Then in a few years' time when you've done that, release like a like a compilation version that's one that's all the snakes and one that's like all the weird fairies. And maybe one that's all like creepy birds. Uh, just so you can buy like a themed version. That'd be nice. Nice. I like it a lot. Uh, peaceful goat-like grazers. The Dahu from France. And again, I like having these sort of... I don't want to say they're mundane because they. it sounds like they do have some kind of mythic elements. But it sounds like, at first look, it sounds like this goat is kind of just like a type of weird goat. <laughs> but if you create enough hooks and flavor around it, it's still an interesting thing to have in your world. Because you've got like, yeah, the, what happens if you eat it? What happens with its pelt? You can make a cloak from it. It's got like weird effects. Like after you encounter it, characters must save or never be able to see, hear or smell them again. And it can't turn around. Yeah, this is this is exactly what I mean with this kind of like just fairy tale logic. I love it. Oh God, no, what? Okay. It's an arm and a leg <laughs> uh, from Gascony. This is a uh, Karma and uh, Raka Cruz. Braca Cruz. So Karma Cruz and Braca Cruz. I don't know. Braca is arm. I'm guessing Karma is leg. Um, yeah. So it's the golden, the golden leg. Okay, right. What's what's the deal? So it's a decomposing leg with an eye at the knee and a mouthful of sharp teeth. Is this a real thing? Is this what you're doing in France, telling this story? Um, they're born out of the anger of a dead person whose body was desecrated shortly after their burial. So if you go and raid a grave and um, chop the limbs off, this is what you're going to end up with. That's awful. Yeah, aura of fear. No shit. Um, <laughs> uh, it can devout you. It's it's not it's not often I get shocked, and I'm not shocked like disgusted. I'm just shocked at like the creativity of this and the fact that this is. They're more shocking because they're based on, like myths that have evolved organically. If this was in like the Monster Manual Part Five, I would be like, oh, they've run out of ideas. Look, they've they've resorted to having like a leg with a mouth. Like what you're playing at, wizards. Um, but the fact that this exists as a real myth is what makes it work. This is a real French monster I see in the chat. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't doubt it. I'm, I'm just, <laughs> I'm, I'm impressed. I, I'm in awe. Uh, Jack and Irons. Did we have a mention of Jack and Irons? No, we we, we had Spring Hill Jack. Uh, Jack and Irons from North Yorkshire. 
So, what's his deal? I, I vaguely know this story. Uh, he's got a pig head. He was bound in chains. He appears at sunset in the high moors and disappears at dawn. So he's just like a big horrible ogre with a tragic story. He's good though. And again, ogres like... Can you get excited about an ogre? But when you... When you wrap it up in this kind of myth you can make it exciting that that's why that's what i'm hoping i can achieve with some of the stuff i'm working on in primeval bastion and by having like it's if you have ogres in your world and you explain how ogres exist that's one thing but if you have the jack and irons or, or the ogre then you can really go in on like what makes the ogre so terrifying And he's, he's carrying around eight mummified heads. Good to know. And uh, Shuka. Oh, so this is Black Shuk. The big black dog. Big scary dog. I think that from what I understand, there's like, I think a lot of different regions in England have their version of this. Uh, but Cambridgeshire uh, here are claiming it. There it is. Big scary dogs. That's what, we, that's what we've got. Um... It's not quite um, monstrous devouring arm, but that but that's what we have. Um, so it can sense to what degree people are evil. It leaves a trail of burning paw prints. It can grab people, and drag them away, and it's uh, it's at home in the fens. Oh, we've got like will-o'-wisp type things as well. Yeah, Remain says a lot of them feel like one-off monsters you replace in your world. And that's what I think. If you're going to have a monster, I, th I think it's one thing to have like unusual animals in your world. And it's another to have like strange people, like cultures. So a culture that is kind of fantastical. But if it's going to be like an actual monster, I know it's like a big ask, but I, I do like it when they're unique. Um, especially if they're going to be like the subject of like stories for the locals. Oh, we, we even have like a hex crawl around the fens. That is a, that is a nice hex map. That is nice. So, I mean, what you could do with this already, it what leaps out to me as the obvious thing to do with this is literally, literally like Monster of the Week style, not not Monster of the Week, the RPG, Monster of the Week as in like the, the trope that you had in like certain series of like the X-Files and things like that, where each week our investigators arrive at a town or they get sent out to a small town somewhere and there's a there's something weird happening and all the locals know about it and they're trying to investigate it and then by the end of the episode it's resolved one way or another they they probably didn't get rid of it but they've at least like found some kind of resolution or encounter with it um so just just do that just work your way through this say this week you're you've been sent out to the fens and you're investigating this black dog that's been dragging people into the marshes uh, Northern California, the people of the holy city, like weird hitchhikers. Okay, and that's it. Um, like I said, this is on Kickstarter now. Oh, I, me I meant to look at what this was on before I started. It went up. That that one's mine. That was me. No, not literally me. That was... Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll take credit for that one. Uh, my, my work is done. Um, but yeah, if you go to Folklore Bestiary, it's it's funding now. You've got two weeks left. And um, it's, it's funded like a million times over. So you don't need to worry about it 
not happening. But yeah, I think that is a pretty cool um, book. I am looking forward to picking it up myself. Um, and we're going to have a very short break of about 45 seconds. And then we're going to come back and we'll talk about something related to this. Um, so bear with me. Okay, we're back. Um, so the reason that I wanted to um, change topic but keep it on the same stream is the other thing that I wanted to talk about is um, the other thing that I've received from the same people behind a folklore bestiary um, is knock. And I've spoken about knock before. I think I did a read through with the first one. And I've, as I mentioned at the start of the video, I've I've done a bit of work with uh, the Merry Mushmen for that in that they've used some blog posts that I've done in the past. And hopefully that will continue. Hopefully they will, they will use something else again in the future. Um, I've, I've only got good things to say about them. Um, so I am, I am biased in that sense. Um, but the reason I wanted to talk about it is... Um, First of all, I haven't had a proper chance to look through issue three yet. I have received my hard copy, but um, I also grabbed the, grabbed the PDF when I knew I was doing this stream. And um, the thing that I wanted to do is I, I get these stupid ideas. When I when I started writing Into the Odd, I used to joke about saying, well, I want to write this game as if it could be somebody's first RPG that they ever pick up and they would still be able to run it. And then I would joke and say, oh, well, you know, but who's who's gonna find Into the Odd as their very first RPG ever? Like, it's this weird thing that you'd have to be already so deep into like a specific part of the RPG community to even know that it exists. Um, you're not just gonna find it in a bookshop. Um, and now, nearly 10 years later, um, it, it, it seems that's something that could happen. Like. Now that we've done this version with Free League and it's going to be more widely available, you never know. Somebody out there might be pick up a second-hand copy or be gifted a copy, and it might be their first RPG that they ever play. Now, the reason I'm going on this tangent is when I'm reading like a book, an RPG book, I always wonder what would it be like if this was the only RPG book that somebody owned. And part of the reason behind that is for a long time, the only RPG book that I, I don't want to say owned because I borrowed it from a friend and I still have it on my bookshelf. The only <laughs> the only um, RPG book that I owned was Out of the Pit, which was the monster manual for advanced fighting fantasy. Now I had fighting fantasy game books, but the only RPG part of it that I had was the monster manual. And... I remember trying to like piece together how would this game actually work from the monster manual. And I like that challenge of trying to fill the blanks. I like to imagine that somebody out there has got some weird book and it's the only RPG book they own and they, they try and find a way to make it work. But I, my hot take is that Knock would actually be a... It's not a perfect fit, but it would be a pretty good one to have like a random issue of Knock as your only... RPG book. Now it does tend to assume that you're using some kind of old school RPG system like basic D&D or something. But if you had like the very bare basics of like how D&D works and you had this as your only book, I would be fascinated to play in someone's game. And here's why. So, if you haven't had knock before, it is a zine that is made up of blog posts. Um, I believe it is all existing material. I don't think they commission anything new in terms of the writing. Certainly everything I've had in there has been um, existing material and I am not in this one. So it is the worst issue yet, but that's fine. You know, everybody makes mistakes. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to skim through and we're going to pick out some highlights from here because I've been meaning to talk a little bit about blogs and this is a way for me to pick out some blogs that if you don't already follow them might be worth looking at and um, and talk about why I think what they do is so so important and so exciting. So 
this is this is a much larger book than the um than the bestiary this is like 200 pages um i'm going to jump through most of them and i'm going to stop at some ones that i know um i've got a little bit more to say about so this post by Dave McGrogan of Monsters and Manuals. The story is the campaign, not the characters. I think there's some good points in here. I'm not going to go into it in too much detail, but it's it, it's a good point. I like it. Um, yeah, we have this world building grotesque. I've not I've not read this one. What happened to the bodies? Nightmare on Lake Thirteen. I slit open the dragon's belly. Here we go. This is a good one. Uh, Picaro and the Story of D&D. This is by James Malajewski. I just realized I've never had to say his name out loud, so I apologize, James, if that's not the right uh, pronunciation. Um, who writes at Grognardia. Now, on the, on the off chance that you are watching this stream and you have somehow not heard of Grognardia, the RPG blog, um, you need to go and read it. Unfortunately, well, it's it's a double-edged sword. James is extremely prol prolific. Other than a several years long hiatus um, a few years ago, um, he will post like every day. So what I would suggest is um, <laughs> going in and if you look, if you search for a particular idea or something like monsters or dungeons or something that you're interested in about sort of old school games, and you will find some great articles from uh, from James. But this is talking about the kind of structure, the kind of picaresque structure of um, of D and D, and it's got some good stuff. D sixty six sites to stumble upon in the woods. So this is what I mean. Like imagine that you didn't have an RPG with a full setting in it. You just had these random articles, random tables. This is nice. I, I, I'm, I'm literally, you know, <laughs> writing about this stuff now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come and steal some of these. Useful fungus. You can never have too many useful fungus tables. And then we have. There's a couple of articles in this one about the domain game, and this is something else that's kind of lingering in my head. I don't think I'm ready to revisit it just yet, but there are stirrings. In the back of my mind about domain level play but there is one article that i always come back to when i anyone says anything about domain level play i always point to the exact same article because i'm a one-trick pony and i do know this one this one is useful but this is it uh, joseph manola whose blog is udan dash adan dot blogspot dot com i believe um, but if you search for Joseph Manola RPG blog, I'm sure it will show up. I love this artwork as well. This is this is awesome. This is seven thoughts about domain level play, and it really changed the way that I thought about domain level play. It's not really been something I've ever explored like at the table, but I've always liked the idea. I've always liked this this promise of like, say, if you're using the D and D the rules cyclopedia or the B E C M I stuff. Um, from old D and D, the promise that you can start as a basic character and you you'll eventually end up running a domain and the game kind of changes. But this article really points out that look, you can have all this stuff going on. You can move up to this domain scale of play, and you can move to a higher a higher level, not a D and D level, like a higher level in terms of like the scope of what you're looking at. But you can still keep the focus on problem solving. You can still have OSR style problems. You can use the threats that you had previously that they're now resources. You can have factions kept nice and simple. You can just let the PCs enjoy the fruits of their success. I'm not going to try and summarize it because it's a, you know, it's a three page article, but it is awesome. So this is called Meet the New Boss. And the best thing is you can just go read this on the site. And if you're interested at all in domain level play, find this blog post and get on it.
got some beginning spell books. This again, Joseph Manola. Unfor <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, he's really good. What I mean is, I, I find it difficult to recommend too many specific posts because I think this is one of the blogs that I just occasionally go back and almost read like cover to cover. Um, this talks about item based problem solving, and this was written. It was, I can't remember what stage I was at with Electric Bastion, and I wonder if I'd already done it or finished writing all of the fail careers. And this is all talking about like having like mundane items, like exactly the kind of thing that you would get in like a starting package in, in Electric Bastion. And so I remember thinking it's, it's like a, it's a bittersweet feeling when somebody you know <laughs> that's really good writes about the topic that you're working on. It's like, it's good because you're like, well, I can learn from this, but it's bad because a, a sort of petty part of you doesn't doesn't want to like have to compete with, with this, um, but it's it's great. It's good stuff. Random Wilderness in a deck of cards. This, I, this Slayer Weapons thing. Um, yeah. I love it. It starts as a plus zero sword and you have to you have to make it into like the, the dragon slaying sword. Tips what to do when your first level magic users cast their spell. Now, listen, I I, I will I, I've gone the full I've ridden the full roller coaster of OSR wisdom where I came in to like OSR stuff and like everyone I was like yeah wizards it's stupid that wizards have one spell per day that's that's awful they should have cantrips they should have cool stuff they can do all the time then I came back around to it, it was like no it's good because it really makes you think about that one spell and you have to really be careful with that and the rest of the time you can still do stuff and I'm now like kind of like having experienced it at the table a few times I'm like in principle I like that but it is it's so bad when you've used the one spell like, like I know you can still do clever stuff and you can still be a wizard, but yeah, I I, I don't know. I, I'm still not completely sold. I, I love this this rabbit. Sorry, this hair. D8 magical hairs. Seven draconic sins. Oh, yes, I remember this. This is cool. So some horrible dragons for your world. A very good article by Ava Islam. I remember this one well. If I'm skipping over an article, by the way, that doesn't mean that I like don't like it. I'm just picking out the highlights because, uh, or, or else we'll be here. You, you will just be experiencing a lot of me staring at the screen, uh, reading it. Ten Commandments for Good Refereeing, uh, Diogo Nogueira. Um, obviously, when I had him on the podcast recently, um, he's just great like you don't you don't need me to tell you that um a lot of the stuff that he writes is just like i mean this is a good example it, it's just like so well written and just gets the point across so clearly um it's the kind of thing you read and you kind of think well yeah that i, I read it and i think well that was obvious but it's made me absorb it in a way that i didn't previously So rumors for your bar. Compelling arena fights. Yes, I remember this. This is good. So let's. You know we won't we won't we won't roll because I want to get to the end of this. Uh, I want to get all the way through this quickly because there are a couple more highlights to get to. But the, I, I would recommend getting it in print. I know it's more expensive, and if you can only get the PDF, you're not going to like miss out. But it is nice having it. Um, to just read through and sit there and really luxuriate and dip into um, just rolling on some tables and sort of really experiencing it. D20 Kids for your... Antoine Bowser of all the board games fame. One, one of the one of the few times I've been like starstruck on Twitter was when um, I, I, I can't remember if I got followed by Antoine Bowser or he mentioned me or something. And said about picking up Electric Bastion Land, and he does. He designed board games like uh, Takedo. Um, seven? Did he do Seven Wonders? Did I make that up? Seven Wonders. 
Hanabi, um, very prolific board game designer, and I was kind of starstruck that he, he liked my game. So these are, these are like going to be like adorable children. My I, I'm too I'm too much of a bad person to include these because I feel like they wouldn't necessarily survive. This is awesome. I love this fairy knight generator. Arnold K, always a safe pair of hands. Uh, the generic optimum. Yes, this is about like encounter design. And this is awesome. It, it sounds like he's given it like the most boring title you can imagine, the generic optimum. But it's it's about having encounters that don't let the players be boring to some extent. Like not, not all the time. Like it's about if, if your characters have like a strategy that they would do, like a generic encounter plan. Like I will go there and shield. You stand behind me and shoot. And then you do that. Um, you can have that happen. But sometimes the most memorable encounters are ones that don't allow that to happen. Like he uses the the Nilbog as an example, which is a it's a backwards goblin, isn't it? So it's healed by damage and harmed by healing, and it's 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 stupid, but I <laughs> I think it sort of sets a tone here and gives a good example. One hit, bit, one hit point monsters. I like this. One of my favorite blog posts to write, um, this is years and years ago, and it was, I, I was copying someone else. Uh, someone else did it for D&D, &D and they said, like, I'm going to make a load of monsters that are one hit die, and they cause D6 damage, and their armor is chain armor. So it's like a generic monster stat wise and then you have to find other ways to make that monster interesting and if you haven't done it and you're interested in monster design i think it's a really cool experiment to do because you can't fall back on making the monster statistically different all you can do is change their behavior their um tactics their like morale the way they interact with the world um i would be even be strict and say you can't give them like special abilities you have to get the you have to make them different purely through flavor and behavior and things like that because those things matter like they are in an rpg it's not like that's just um like paint it's like the, the fact that they behave this certain way is in many ways more important than the fact that they have an armor class of like 11 or 12 Ugh, vermin that's that's horrible Yeah, and obviously if you don't get the print version, you can't cut out all these gold coins. A load of weirdos. When not to kill a player character. Okay. When you have the chance to kill, a lot more. The old school playstyle is famous for let the dice fall where they may philosophy, which certainly makes for a high stakes experience. Characters can die if they take the wrong decision at the wrong time, or if they roll poorly after an unlucky random encounter roll in the first minute of the game. At the same time, if they roll really well, they can turn a very challenging encounter into an easy fight. That's one of the things that makes these games so exciting. With that in mind, I start to do something I almost never do, save a character's life when the dice would have killed them. But I ignore the dice so I can give them a tough choice to the other players. Will they risk their characters in an attempt to save another PC from certain death? Okay. If this was anyone but Diogo... I would be slightly mistrustful, but I, I I trust his wisdom on this one. Weird cobbled weapons are always good. Rations. Advice for running large groups. Wow, we're we're not even halfway through. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna speed run, speed run the last bits. Power of rats. What are these sturges doing? Monster quirks. Ah, this is, I've read this before, yes, this is a really interesting sort of breakdown of the caverns of Thracia, I want to say. Never had to say it out loud in my life, by Janelle Jacques. D12 Sword Saint Techniques. This is like Book of Nine Swords for, for your OSR game. 
The Tartaros. This this guy's following us around. I'm going to have a seizure if I look at that page any longer. Abstract and Concrete Magic by Paolo Greco. I, I vaguely remember this one. I remember it being very kind of interesting, thought-provoking. I, I, I did read this article and my guilty pleasure is I, I it's from it's from reading like old computer magazines and old like white dwarfs when I was like a kid I always used to love it when like the editor would like leave a little note and mark it as Ed it, I don't know why it, it made it feel like you were like seeing behind the scenes or like it made you feel like it was a more personal you weren't just reading a book you were reading like a I guess like if I'm going to be uh, really pretentious um, about it, um, it's it's almost like I'm not going to say it's like social media. I was I was going to try and find a way to pitch that it was like social media, but it's, it, it it was not like social media. But there was also something really charming about that, and this has got lots of little editor notes which I love. Bugbear witch, great. Less rules to do more. I remember this one. This is a good read. This is an entire game by Nate Treem. So yeah, you don't you don't need D and D. This is this is your your whole game, Radical Quest. And then we have a load of maps, which I'm gonna skip over because you can see they're great. We have a load of monsters, which you can see. I'm gonna jump over because I don't want to give too much away. You have some classes. This is what I mean. Like imagine if the only classes you had for your game were Lost Droid, Rat Catcher. The Blemmy, Laser Mage. I mean, this is sounding right. <laughs> These are probably just straight from Troika. The Space Vampire, the Chenote, and they're your character classes. That's that's what you get to choose from. And then we have a little. I say a little dungeon. That's that's quite a sizable dungeon. Some classified adverts. And there's even a random table on the back cover. So that is Knock. And I just wanted to give... I, I know I've spoken about Knock before. But I did want to give it another little... Another little moment in the spotlight. Because I think it's... If you... I'm, I'm going to get like... I'm going to get preachy now. <laughs> there's a lot of good uh, RPG discussion on Discords. On Twitter. Um... On TikTok, there's people making really interesting videos. But to me, and I know this makes me sound like an old geezer. To me, none of them quite scratch the same itch as reading blog posts. And it, it's a different thing. And it, it might not be for you. It might not be for everyone. But if you enjoy the idea of these articles that are kind of able to go into a bit more detail in things and... You get that feel of the author's voice a bit more somehow. I always think you get you don't get the same sort of like I feel like on Twitter you often get the Twitter voice where you could be listening to anyone, um, and it's the same with YouTube videos to some extent. But a blog somehow feels much more personal to me. There's certain authors that I feel even if I've never spoken to them, I feel like I know them and I feel like I can see how their game would work, um, and I feel like I've learned more from rpg blogs than i've learned from any book on the shelf if i'm being completely honest and that's not an overstatement i genuinely believe that is the case and if you if you want a really quick way to get into some of those blog posts knock is like the best way to do it just pick up pick up all three issues of knock um yeah i'm not i'm not sure which ones are currently available but knock three is certainly currently available i think um but yeah check them out um i will be back next week where i will be talking about something else i'm trying to think what i'm doing next week it's not a read through next week we're doing something else i'll have a think i can't remember what it is um i have a couple of things left in the pipeline but we'll we'll see which one comes out um and as always if you want to support what i do with these streams uh, you can go to patreon.com forward slash bastionand 
if you want to keep up to date with everything I'm doing with this primeval Bastionan thing I keep talking about, uh, you can go to bastionan.com where the playtest document is available. And there is a link there to the Discord server, which is the best place to talk if you want to talk about any of the things that I'm doing. Um, so that is it for this week. Uh, thank you for watching and see you next time.